been working uh, since then in the fraud business and fraud smuggling organization. Uh, specific activities that I work on include the uh, study of plastic packaging smuggling, exposed plasmas, uh, charge transfer to nanostructures, and layer conversion. So, what we're going to do today is give us uh, an update of this uh, latest research. Thank you very much, George, and uh, welcome to all of you. I'm happy to be here, um, happy to have the opportunity to come here to Harvard and share with you some of our research. And I'm going to talk about um, what the title says, High Throughput Modeling and Discovery of Two-Dimensional Materials. And um, before I, I start doing that, I would like um, to just thank um, the people who've done the work and the funding agencies. This in particular is the uh, Danish National Research Foundation, who have funded a center of excellence that I'm part of on nanostructured graphene, uh, which is running for 10 years. And you can see here we have quite a few people spanning um, almost all aspects of, of research in 2D materials. And then the European Research Council for uh, an ERC grant that I got last year on um, designing two-dimensional materials for controlling light matter interactions at the nanoscale. And uh, here are the people. Um, from the group. These are the people who've done the work that I'm going to talk about. PhD students from, from DTU and former postdocs now working um, um, at other places. Um, so if, uh, if I'm not saying otherwise, then these are the people who've, who've done the work. Okay, so let me start by telling you why I think two-dimensional materials are uh, extremely exciting and, and fascinating. Um, so first of all, um, these are materials that are extremely thin. And due to the extreme thinness of these materials, quantum confinement effects are very pronounced. And also the dielectric screening, so the interaction, the screening of the interaction between charged particles and materials are very enhanced. And this means that um, properties that we see, in particular electronic properties in these materials, are very different from what we know from more conventional materials. Uh, in particular, many body uh, effects are, are dramatically enhanced. Then it's possible to stack different two-dimensional materials on top of each other, and therefore, we, uh, thereby we get a platform where we can really control electrons, their spins, their interactions with phonons and photons at the atomic length scale. So it's a, it's a unique platform, not just for studying uh, physics on that length scale, but also for controlling physics on that length scale. The fact that the materials bind weakly to each other, you can almost see in this temp picture here, the black lines between the 2D layers, that is just vacuum. So they bind with van der Waals forces weakly together. This means that the interfaces we get in these types of materials are atomically sharp. So that means we can create artificial materials where the properties, they change over uh, the size of an atom. For example, from a magnetic to a non-magnetic material or for, from a metal to, to an insulator. That's quite unique. Um, then they are ideal for benchmarking of theory. And since I'm doing theory, I'm also interested in systems where I can benchmark my theory, obviously. And, and these are, because the crystalline environment here is so well defined, this is also quite, uh, uh, quite unique. And it's a, um, it's a benchmark, uh, um, ideal benchmark uh, systems. And finally, there is an exciting potential, because of all these reasons, for technology applications. And, um, this includes nanophotonics, optoelectronics, catalysis, or, or battery electrodes. So um, now that we're all motivated to hear about 2D materials, I would like to also give a brief overview of the history uh, of 2D materials as it's developed over the past decade. Um, so these are uh, just a brief selection of, of some of the main discoveries that I think have shaped the field, and these are just my personal impression. Uh, and it's by no means exhaustive, but um, anyway, so it all, all started in 2004 with the isolation of graphene. And as you probably know, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for the um, groundbreaking um, uh, measurements on uh, isolated graphene flakes. So this took place, these measurements took place from 2004 to 2010. This was mainly focusing on transport properties of graphene. Um, they are quite... Uh, special. Now, uh, around the same year, research in other two-dimensional materials took off, and in particular, the class of transitional metal dichalcogenides 
uh, were discovered. In particular, it was found that when you thin down some of these layered bulk materials down to a monolayer, there is a transition from an indirect to a direct band gap. And soon after, uh, this, the fact that these materials have a band gap was exploited to create a single layer, an atomically thin um, field effect transistor. Um, and then the year after, it was discovered that MOS2 can also be used for valetronics, so you can use left or right-handed uh, uh, circularly polarized light to, uh, to excite carriers in different valleys of, of this material here. So this comes from a combination of uh, spin orbit splitting here and the strong coupling between the spins and the orbital angular momentum. In 2013, it was proposed uh, by Andre Geim and, and co-workers that one could stack different types of two-dimensional materials to create new types of artificial heterostructures called van der Waals heterostructures, and the first examples of these types of materials were, were reported in 2013. In 2014, um, a new type of two-dimensional material called phosphorine, a single layer of phosphorus atoms, uh, was reported. Um, it has a band gap of around 1 eV, so in that sense it's, it's ideal for many applications um, in optoelectronics. Uh, the problem with phosphorine is that it's not very stable. It oxidizes very rapidly unless you encapsulate it in other types of materials and that way protect it from oxygen. Uh, the first light emitting diodes created um, in these very um, advanced uh, van der Waals heterostructures containing both TMDs and graphene and hexagonal boron nitride were reported in 2015. In 2016, it was also discovered that uh, two-dimensional layers such as hexagonal boron nitride or some of the TMDs can host uh, quantum emitters, so single photon emitters, and this is a field of, of uh, active research these days. It's uh, still not completely clear what the microscopic um, nature of these single photon emitters are. Uh, in 2017, the first two-dimensional uh, ferromagnet uh, was discovered, um, chromium triiodide, and this was quite a surprise because there was this famous theorem due to um, Mermin and Wagner that says that you cannot have long-range order in two dimensions, but it turns out that if you have an isotropy in the material, so if there is an easy out-of-plane axis, then the mermin wagner theorem doesn't hold, and it is, in fact, possible to have long-range order at finite temperatures. So with all these 2D materials that I've mentioned so far, the question naturally arises how many of these two-dimensional materials are out there, and the, part, the answer was partially given uh, last year based on data mining of experimental crystal structure databases, one can go in and see how many of these known crystal structures are actually layered, and then based on DFT calculations, you can calculate the exfoliation energies, and the number um, that is out there now is around uh, 1,000 uh, crystals that potentially could be exfoliated into single layers. Okay, so this uh, historical overview was made last year, and uh, it's already outdated, because very recently there's been um, a lot of work on uh, twist angles. So if you take two layers of, uh, of graphene and you twist them by an angle of around one degree, it goes superconducting. Um, so this was discovered um, last year. Here you can see the proof. The superconducting temperature is, is, is quite low, but this is an example uh, that shows that van der Waals heterostructures are more than just the sum of their parts, right? So you take two layers of graphene, put them together and twist them, you get superconductivity. So this is really remarkable and a very interesting uh, uh, line of research these days. This has also been done for the optical properties. Here's an example of two uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, two different monolayers. Um, and then you can have excitons in these materials where the electron is located on one material and the, elect and, and the hole is on the other material, so that's an interlayer exciton. And by varying the twist angle between the two layers, you can tune the emission frequency of that interlayer exciton here in that way. Okay, so uh, let me um, tell you a little bit about what I'm doing, because I've shown you a lot of, of interesting experimental results, but uh, I'm not doing any experiments. I'm only doing uh, computations. In particular, I'm doing what is known as first principles calculations. And these are types of calculations where you run them on big supercomputers. The only input to these calculations 
is the type of atoms and where they sit in the structure. So there are no free parameters. And then you solve the Schrodinger equation and you can calculate the electronic structure of the material. And the conventional way of doing that is you start with the material that you're interested in and then you compute the properties that you're interested in. Okay? We're using interatomic potentials, density functional theory and many body quantum theories when we do these calculations. What we're really interested in doing is solving the inverse problem where we start with some property that we would like this material to have and then we figure out what kind of materials we should go and synthesize in order to find a material that have these uh, uh, properties. And for doing that, we're using high throughput screening. I'll say more about that later in this talk. We're also uh, learning how to do machine learning. Um, and we also employ exploiting uh, materials databases and also building up databases. So this is obviously essential. If you want to train a machine, you need data to train on. OK, so these are the types of methods that's, that, that I'm working with. So let me, just to get started, give you one example, which is a little bit old by now, but I think it still illustrates what these, uh, these calculations can be used for. This is uh, coming back to this um, atomically thin transistor that I also already mentioned. This came out in 2011, and we thought, this is really interesting. Let's try to calculate the mobility, because this was one of the key points in this paper. Uh, what characterizes a good um, a uh, transistor material is that it should be a semiconductor, it should be thin, it should, should have a high mobility, right? And the mobility that uh, was reported in this paper here was around 200, which is pretty, pretty high. So we went on, um, did the quantum calculations and came up with mobilities of this material as a function of temperature. You can see the scaling here. Um, and the nice thing when you do calculations is you can try to switch off the acoustic phonons you can try to switch off the out-of-plane phonon modes because we were speculating maybe they were quenched due to the substrate on which this two-dimensional material was placed. But if you look at the total result here, this is the calculation of the mobility limited by coupling to phonons. That's the black curve, and we have a room temperature mobility of around 400, which is not too far from the reported 200. Um, so that's sort of what you could expect. And theory obviously overestimates because in reality, they're also scattering on charge defects and other things, contact resistance that is not included in here. Um, then unfortunately, uh, uh, there was a comment to this paper and in a reply, the authors corrected their number from 200 to 10. And now our uh, quantum calculations of 400 was pretty far from the reported uh, experimental number. Um, so that was a bit sad, but then luckily, um, in 2015, um, in the group of James Hone, they created now these very nice heterostructures here where you have, this is now a tri-layer MOS2. You can see it here, a close-up. This is not a single layer, but a tri-layer. They also did similar samples with monolayers, which is now contacted with graphene as the, as the electrode, and then it's all encapsulated in hexagonal boron nitride, which is a white band gap semiconductor that protects this entire sample from, from the environment. And with these samples, they get now uh, mobilities in very good agreement with the calculation. So you can see here, this is again as a function of temperature and the colored lines here is the results of our calculations. So this also shows that encapsulation in this field of 2D material is essential. It can really enhance and improve the properties of the materials because a 2D material is nothing but surface. And that means it's extremely sensitive to what goes on in the environment. So you really need to carefully protect this material from the environment if you want to see the uh, intrinsic properties of that material. Okay, so now um, I've told you why 2D materials are interesting. Yes? Yeah. Normally in a, just regular semiconductors to get a low temperature, you get, you know, charged impurities in the sort of surface thing they're just sitting on. The surface So I, then you have, to, this is Boltzmann calculations, right? So what you can also do is the only scattering mechanism that we put into these calculations were the electron phonon scattering. So you can also, based on, on, on DFT calculation, calculate the potential from a given type of defect, point defect or even a charge defect, and then you calculate matrix elements with your wave functions onto that 
uh, perturbation and include that, uh, then you need to know the concentration of the impurities and all these things, uh, but you can do it, yes. Uh, it wasn't included in these calculations. So I think now we are uh, all very uh, interested in 2D materials, hopefully, and uh, we know that theory is great. It can sometimes be even more accurate than, than experiments. And I think this is a good place now to, uh, to give you the outline of the next 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to uh, uh, split the talk into two parts. In the first part, I'll talk about physics of 2D materials, in particular, uh, the physics of electronic excitations, band structures, excitons, coupling between um, electrons in the materials and light sources. That'll be the first part, and the second part is more on the data-driven approaches to come up with new types of two-dimensional materials, to try to discover new types of two-dimensional materials with nice properties. <coughs> okay, so I'm first going to talk about electronic excitations, and the main thing there, if we're going to to understand how electrons behave in materials is to understand how the electrons interact with each other. And they interact not via the 1 over R Coulomb interactions, but via the screened Coulomb interaction, which is screened by all the other electrons in the material. And what we typically do if we have a bulk semiconductor, we just take 1 over R and then we multiply with the dielectric constant. The problem is that in two dimensions, most of the field lines, they don't go through the material here, they go out inside the vacuum or whatever is outside the material. And this means that if the charges are very far apart, there is essentially no field lines inside the material. On the other hand, if they are close together, a relatively large fraction of the field lines are inside the material. And this leads to a non-trivial distance dependence of the screen Coulomb interaction in the material. Uh, what is also clear from this picture is that the screening in 2D materials is going to be weak. And that is the reason why many body effects are more pronounced in two-dimensional materials and why they have many of these interesting pro properties that have made them famous. Uh, this um, was the real space picture of screening in two-dimensional materials. We can also become a bit more mathematical and look at the consequences for that on the dielectric function. So the dielectric function is a function of, of the wave vector Q if we Fourier transform from real space, assuming that the dielectric function is just a function of r minus r prime, we can Fourier transform with respect to that coordinate. So what we're typically used to seeing is something like the dashed line here. This is actually the dielectric function for bulk hexagonal bond nitride. So a bulk structure consisting of stacked layers of, of these, these uh, uh, boron nitride layers here. Now, if you thin this down and look at a monolayer, then you get the green line. So that is the dielectric function of a two-dimensional material. And it's strikingly different from the 3D uh, in, in this region here, which uh, uh, correspond to small Q vectors, that is Q vectors for which the wavelength of that wave is longer than the thickness of the material. This really marks whether this material behaves in terms of screening as a 2D material or 3D material. In here, you see there is a linear dispersion of, of the dielectric function, and it goes to one. And this is what I said before in the real space picture. This means that there is simply no screening in the long distance limit. There's no screening of charges there. Whereas you, if you go to inter intermediate Q vectors here, there is a, a large amount of screening. Okay. This has consequences. This has a number of consequences. One of them I already mentioned is that many body effects are, are enhanced. Uh, we get, for example, strongly bound excitons or trions in these materials. Excitons are these bound electron hole pairs, and they can have binding energies that are on the order of half an electron volt, which is unheard of if you think of inorganic uh, uh, semiconductors um, where they are just a few milliEV, typically. Um, these materials interact very strongly with light for, this, for the same reason. If you look at the exciton series, then in three-dimensional materials, you get a Rydberg series of those excitons. Uh, but now because of this, strange or, or uh, unconventional distance-dependent screening, this doesn't hold anymore for two-dimensional materials, so the, uh, the series of, of uh, excitonic states doesn't follow the 1 over n squared series <coughs> that we know from 3D. Uh, okay, and there's a range of other consequences. Now, if we take a material, it's seldomly just floating in, in free space, right? So typically it will be sitting on a substrate or will be embedded in a heterostructure. Then the field lines here, they go through all the other materials in this structure. 
Um, that creates some challenges, but it also creates opportunities because it means that we can now engineer the dielectric environment um, and in that way tune the strength of the Coulomb interaction inside the material. This means we can start to manipulate the electronic properties of, of the 2D materials by tuning the, the environment. But let's start with the challenges. So I'm a computational physicist and this means I need, when I, when I have to do a calculation for a given structure, I have to put those structure into a unit cell and then I repeat that unit cell to create my crystal. If I have two different 2D materials and their in-plane lattice constant doesn't match, then I get more red patterns and I get these very huge supercells that are completely unfeasible for me to simulate. Okay? So that's a, a challenge that we've overcome in the following way, at least if we're interested in the dielectric properties. So we start with each of the two-dimensional materials of, of this heterostructure. And then we compute, using quantum mechanics, um, their dielectric function. So we use a low-dimensional representation of, of this dielectric function. But nevertheless, this constitutes what we call a dielectric building block. Okay? We do that for all the 2D materials in our heterostructure. And then we take those dielectric building blocks and then we solve Maxwell's equations afterwards uh, to couple those together. So electrons in the different layers can talk to each other through the Coulomb interaction there. But what is neglected here is the quantum mechanical interaction, that is the hybridization between wave functions in neighboring layers. That, that we are ignoring at this point. But by doing this, we get around this problem with the not matching lattice uh, constants, and we can calculate a dielectric tensor for the entire heterostructure. So what can we do with that? Well, we can calculate, for example, plasmons. Plasmons are collective um, um, oscillations of an electron gas in a metal. And if you take graphene and you dope it a little bit, you have free carriers, and they can oscillate and create a plasmon. If we take two graphene layers and we separate them by three layers of hexagonal boron nitride, so this is just a dielectric spacer now, uh, and then we have a substrate here also consisting of hexagonal boron nitride, then we can calculate uh, the plasmon in this material and it looks like this. So that it goes to zero here. This is again a consequence of the reduced dimensionality. In 3D, a plasmon would go to a finite uh, frequency in the Q going to zero limit. But this is again different. In, um, in 2D materials, so this is what we get. Now, if you look at the energies here, they are sort of in the mid-infrared uh, regime, infrared, mid-infrared regime, and we know that that's also where the phonons live, okay? So if the phonons are optically active, they might be able to hybridize with these plasmons, so we better include also the response from the phonons, and that is what we do up here. So for each of these dielectric building blocks, we add a term here, which we also calculate from first principles. So these would be the Born charges. This is the dynamical matrix that gives you the phonon frequencies, and these are just the masses of the atoms. This we compute, that's a matrix, and we add it to the electronic response. And now you can see what happens to this nice plasmon dispersion. It, it breaks up here, so there's a, an avoided crossing where this plasmon couples with longitudinal optical modes in the boron nitride. Okay. Uh, this, is, uh, this is another mode, uh, optically active vibrational mode in the HBN that is not hybridizing with the plasmon for symmetry reasons. Now, this is a heterostructure. That heterostructure would typically not have free floating in space either. You would put it on a substrate. So let's try to add a silicon oxide substrate here. And we've also implemented now in this method that we can have a substrate down here. So the way it's done in practice is when we solve the Maxwell equations to for, for this heterostructure, we are just applying different boundary conditions uh, if we have a substrate down there. So this is pretty straightforward, and then we can use uh, the dielectric function of silicon oxide. And again, if you compare from here to there, the silicon uh, oxide substrate, even though it's um, some hundred nanometer, uh, at least some hundred angstroms away from the graphene layer, it still have a pronounced effect on the, on the plasma spectrum up here. So even the optically active phonons of the silicon oxide can influence the plasmons in this bilayer graphene. So this shows that uh, the phonons and substrates, um, even, even if the substrate is far away, is really crucial to take into account if you want to understand the optical properties of these materials in the, in the uh, mid-infrared regime. Okay, so let's talk about band structure. So I was supposed to talk about electronic excitation. So far I've been talking about screening. 
Now, how is that related to band structures? As you know, the way to calculate, the way to measure a band structure is, for example, by using photoemission spectroscopy. It could be angle resolved, but you come in with a photon, you shoot out an electron, and you measure the energy, the kinetic energy of the electron that comes out, and you know the energy of the photon that you shot in. So now you can also uh, extract the energy of the hole left behind in this band structure. And that is uh, how you can probe at least the occupied part of the band structure. You can also do inverse photoemission if you want to probe the unoccupied states, but that's much, much more difficult in practice. Now, the crucial thing is that what happens next after this electron has been ejected is that this hole that is left behind is being screened by the other electrons in the material. So the, it, it forms what is known as a quasi-particle. So a quasi-particle is that whole with screening cloud of electrons surrounding it. This is a dynamical process that happens there. Uh, and to capture that properly, we need to go to many body perturbation theory. And then we calculate the self-energy operator. Uh, this is getting a bit technical, but uh, just so I'll try to um, tell you in words what it is. This is the screen Coulomb interaction, the W I was talking about before, okay? And this is a Green's function propagator. So you take the product of these two, and then you get the effects on the energy from screening this hole left behind by the other electrons uh, in the system. And that goes into this quasi-particle equation that we can solve. How good is that? So here is a benchmarking on four different uh, monolayers where we've taken the effect of the substrates out of the measurements so we believe we have like the pure band gaps here quasi-particle band gaps of these monolayers and we compare those to our GW calculations the scheme that I just mentioned before and you can see that the difference there is less than 0.2 EV which in relative error is less than 10 percent so I think this is as good as it gets this is also around the error that, that we can expect uh, to have in the experiments over here. So this is, this is pretty good. Okay, so what happens if we take such a two-dimensional material and put it on a substrate? Uh, so here is, an ex here is a, a picture of a hexagonal bond nitride layer and a graphene layer, and we form a, a heterostructure out of those two. Here is shown the band structure, calculated with a, a standard mean field approach, LDA, and then this many-body GW method. That's the red curve. Here you see the, 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 the band gap of the HBN, if we take the red curves here, and there you see the Dirac point from the graphene. How does this band structure depend on the distance between the graphene layer and the HBN? So if we put an electron into a previously unoccupied state into the conduction band of the HBN, then we would expect the screening cloud to form in the graphene layer up here. Right? That is the dressed quasi-particle. So now the quasi-particle, this electron, there is of course also a screening cloud in the HBN, but in a, in, on top of that, there'll be screening cloud in the graphene layer. And in a simple sort of classical picture, we would be able to model this with, a, with an image charge. Now, a graphene layer is not just a perfect uh, metal, as we typically, um, which is sort of where the image charge model would really apply, but let's try to do it nevertheless then we would expect a one over distance dependence here on the band gap. So, because that, why, why is that? That's because um, the band gap is really what does it cost to take an electron out of the valence band? Uh, that, is the, that is the valence band maximum here. What does it cost to take that electron out? When we take that electron out, we have a charged hole left behind that will be screened uh, by, the, by the graphene layer over here. So if we calculate the band gap, we can see that there is, in fact, a one over distance dependence in that band gap over here. And the dashed curve here is a fit to a one over distance dependence. Uh, this is the freestanding H, uh, HBN result. You can see there is a significant reduction of the band gap of around one electron volt due to the screening by the, um, by the graphene layer. This is completely missed by standard DFT methods. You need to go to many body perturbation theory to, cop to capture these renormalization effects. Okay, so we thought about how can we, um, how can we do this for general van der Waals heterostructures? So uh, imagine that you have a heterostructure and now we look at layer number I. Can we calculate the energy of an electronic state in K in layer I of this heterostructure? Well, we can do a GW calculation for the isolated monolayer. Then we can correct that by hybridization that we can probably, probably treat 
in DFT or with tight binding or whatever simple single particle picture. That's a hybridization effect. And then there's this more complex screening effect, effect that requires the screened interaction. That we can calculate using this QEH model that I introduced in the start. Uh, so we can calculate the change in the screen Coulomb interaction due to the presence of the other layers in the heterostructure. And we can calculate a change in the GW self energy due to this. And if we do that, we can start calculating band gaps of two dimensional materials um, in different configurations. So here are uh, six different semiconductors that have been put on graphene or encapsulated in, in, in graphene environments. And you can see how the band gap can change here by up to one electron volt by doing this. And the important thing is that there is no hybridization. It's not because of a hybridization with the wave functions in the semiconductor. It's simply because the dielectric environment is changing the way electrons inside this material are interacting with each other. So we can do something even more elegant. We can imagine this, this type of structure where we have a two-dimensional semiconductor here that we place on a single layer of graphene, and then we have some HBN, and then we have a gate down here. By changing the gate, we can change the concentration of free carriers in the graphene layer. So we can change the doping level. So when we do that, we also change the screened interaction up in the two-dimensional semiconductor. And in fact, these are calculations, not experiments, but uh, I think it's, it's true nevertheless. Um, as you change the doping concentration in the graphene layer, you change the band gap here from, so this is MOS2, it's 2.5 if it's freestanding, then you put it on graphene without doping the graphene, then it reduces uh, by 0.3 eV, and then you increase the doping level by changing the gate, and you can continuously tune the band gap over 0.2 electron volts by doing that. So that's a quite significant change in the band gap that you can achieve by this without touching the states of the MOS2. Yes? Is this the issue with the work done in graphene carriers? Well, you don't have to care about it because, because the, the charges are just living up here. They're not going between the graphene and the semiconductor. So the, the, this is just a matter of, of looking at the band structure of this layer here. I mean, sure, there will be a Schottky barrier, between this layer and the graphene, but we haven't looked at it here. We've only looked at the size of the band gap inside the uh, two-dimensional semiconductor. But if you were to put a, a carrier, if you had a vacuum, uh, okay. Okay. Okay, good. What about excitons? So now we've talked about band structures. Excitons are these uh, bound electron hole pairs that can live inside the band gap of a semiconductor. And uh, the fully quantum mechanical model would be a superposition of electron hole pair, uh, electron hole pairs over the entire Brill ring zone. And you can, as you know, sort of from solid state textbooks, you can go to real space and then you get a mod one year model that looks just like a hydrogen atom um, to represent your exciton. Um, so what we do is, is a more elaborate approach called the beta salpeter equation. These are the main equations, but I'll just flash it so you know that we're doing serious stuff. And then move on to the results. This is the um, absorption spectrum calculated for a single layer of MOS2. Um, here in the black curve, we're including the electron hole interaction. You do the photo excitation, the electron interacts with the hole left behind and form the exciton. The blue is what you would get out of a single particle picture, okay? A single particle description where you neglect the correlation between the electron and the hole. And you can see the dramatic difference. The reason why the difference is so strong is because the electron and the hole interaction is so strong in two dimensional materials. You get these two peaks here, which are the, called the A and the B excitons. They are sitting approximately half an EV below the band gap, indicated by the dashed gray line here and they come from a spin-orbit split valence band here, so you can have two types of transitions. Again, how well does this compare to experiments? These are calculated positions of the lowest peak in the absorption spectrum, and these are the experiments, and again, we are below 0.1 EV, so again, this is as good as it gets. Um, so we have high accuracy here. Now, these were, this was benchmarked on intralayer exits, on where the electron and the hole are sitting in the same material. Uh, but by combining two different 2D materials, two different semiconductors with a staggered band alignment, 
you could create interlayer excitons where the electron lives in one material and the hole lives in another material. So these excitons can have very long lifetimes because of the reduced spatial overlap between the wave function of the electron and the hole. And here's an example where uh, they've used this to make uh, an optical uh, transistor. So you shine a, light, shine a laser here in this region, you create an exciton, that exciton diffuses, the exciton is neutral, so you cannot drive it with an electric field, but it diffuses here over to this region and then it radiates and you read out the light over here. So that's, that's the on state of the transistor, but applying a, an electric field perpendicular to this uh, uh, bilayer here, you shift the relative band alignment. So now suddenly um, you're changing this energy here. So you can make this region forbidden for the exciton. So if the exciton energy, the energy of that exciton doesn't match with the band alignment in here, it cannot diffuse through, and then that way you've shut off your optical uh, uh, transistor. So that's nice. Um, so we've looked at other types of excitons here um, and how you can play with that electric field to tune the properties of the excitons. So here are, are different types of excitons. This is the pure charge transfer type or the interlayer type where an electron is sitting in one material and the hole is sitting in the other material. Uh, this is an intralayer type where the electron and the hole live in the same material, but of course they can also hybridize with each other, these excitons, and you can so, so this is bilayer MOS2, and if you look at the black curves here, those are the charge transfer excitons. There is an A and an B exciton. Remember from this slide here, there is an A and the B exciton in each of the monolayers. Uh, by applying an electric field, you can move these up and down because you're changing the relative alignment of the levels here. So you're changing the energy of the charge transfer excitons, but not of the intralayer excitons, okay? So you can start playing around with them and you can find a region here where there is a charge transfer exciton that mixes with an interlayer exciton here. So that looks like this, okay? And <clears throat> this is a picture of this in real space, what, what is happening. Um, an excitonic wave function depends on two coordinates. It depends on the coordinate of the electron and the hole, right? So to plot this, you have to fix the position of the hole and plot uh, uh, the probability distribution for the for the electron. So this is what an intralayer exciton looks like, right? This is where the hole is, and this is also where the electron is. This is a pure uh, charge transfer exciton. This is where the electron is, or sorry, this is where the hole is, and this is where the electron is. It's exactly in the other layer. But then these are types of, of, of hybridized um, intralayer charge transfer-like exitons, where if the hole is here, then the electron can be both at the same layer, but also with some probability on the other layer. And this, the same goes for this one over here. Okay, so this is just to show that you can use, ah, here, is, here it is. This is the dependence on the electric field. So you can see um, the intralayer excitons here, the, a, the red curves here, you cannot change them with an electric field because the electron and the hole live in one of the two layers. So applying a field moves the electron and the hole in the same way. But if you have, and if you have an, a, a pure interlayer exciton where the electron is there and the hole is there, then you can tune the energy, but you cannot couple to it with light because the electron and the hole are spatially separated. But these mixed interlayer excitons that have one component intralayer and one component that is interlayer, you can actually tune those with the electric field and at the same time they are optically active. So you can see them in the absorption spectrum here. So you kind of combine the best of the two types of excitons by, by hybridizing them in that way. Okay, so let me now uh, move to a project that um, is very recent, so it's, it's unpublished work. And this is work that um, my, my student here, Mark, did in collaboration with uh, Yaniv Kurman and Ido Kamina from Technic Technion University in Israel, and then Frank Coppet. So these uh, guys are also doing, uh, doing theory, more from the nanophotonic side, and Frank Coppens is doing experiments. Uh, on 2D materials, he's at ICFO in Barcelona. Uh, so in the paradigm of, of far field optics, which is sort of, unless you study nanophotonics, this is what optics is, right? Electrons, they come in, or, or phon photons are described as plane waves. They have essentially no momentum. And this means the only way you can absorb a photon is by a vertical uh, transition in the brilliant zone. You can also, if you have phonons, you can absorb or emit phonons, but this is a very, very rare event. Um, 
So mainly you make vertical transitions. But once you go to the nanoscale, light can be very different from uh, a photon in free space and it can acquire a finite momentum in particular if it's confined. So um, here's an example where the authors of this paper here imagine having a quantum well, um, an indium gallium arsenide quantum well here in contact with a graphene layer and now light in the form of plasmons in this graphene layer have dispersion curves that look like this. I've already shown you one of these earlier and there are three different ones corresponding to three different doping levels of charge carriers in the graphene layer. These lines here, the gray lines, is the dispersion of the uh, transitions, um, inter-subband transitions in this quantum well. And whenever these cross, there is the possibility of exchanging an electron hole pair in the quantum well with a plasmon in the graphene layer, right? So we have the possibility now of coupling to transitions that are not vertical in the brilliant zone but have a finite Q because the plasmon carries a finite momentum. So uh, to get this to work and to get really strong coupling between the plasmon and the quantum well, we need the quantum well to be very close to the graphene layer because the, the field, the light field associated with the plasmon is confined, as you can see here, very close around the uh, uh, graphene layer. So therefore we need a quantum well that is very thin. And the idea that we came up with was to try to stack TMDs or other semiconducting 2D materials and create what we call van der Waals um, uh, quantum wells. And so now here is an illustration of a band structure around the conduction band minimum of such a stacked MOS2 layer. You can see there are these subbands here corresponding to standing waves perpendicular to this quantum well. And we can imagine having transitions between these uh, subbands inside the quantum well. They're extremely thin, so we can get them very close to the graphene layer, and also they have a strong coupling out of plane to light. And this is what we need because um, the, the field from the graphene layer will have, um, will, will have a, a slope that is sort of pointing out of plane, and therefore we need a material that has a large out of plane dipole moment in order to excite them with, with the plasma. So we've done calculations for this kind of setup where we have a graphene layers and then a TMD quantum well and then deposit it on a metal. Um, and what you should imagine here is that you've photo excited an electron. So now there's an electron in this second subband and it can go down to the first subband here. There are some dopants uh, sitting down here in the bottom of that subband here. So we're looking at, at transitions uh, from here to there. Um, and what we would like to have, a, we would like to have a very strong coupling to the light so that we can enhance the radiative recombination of this electron up here with a hole in the lower band. So that's called the Purcell effect. We would like to have a large Purcell enhancement uh, and exploiting the graphene field for, for getting that. So we solve this Weisskopf-Wigner model where we basically uh, evolve in time the wave function of this electron up here, taking into account that it can stay in its, ground, in, in its excited state up here, and this uh, means the uh, amount of photons, so there's zero photons to begin with, or the electron can go down into one of the ground states here, G, and then excite a photon, right? And this is now not a, a classical photon, or this is not a, a, a photon in free space, this is now uh, an excitation in the graphene layer here that is denoted by this one M here. Okay, this we can solve, and here's the result. Uh, first, let me show you, this is the effective coupling strength between the electron uh, and, uh, in the initial and the final state. And here is the plasma. You can see where the plasma is, there's a strong coupling. So that makes sense. There's a strong coupling to the plasma field. But there is also the electron hole pair continuum in the graphene layer up here, which is not really light. These are just electron hole pairs. So that electron can go down and excite an electron hole pair inside the graphene layer. This is not really what we want. I mean, we've made the electron go down in energy, we've made it recombine, but we've lost the energy. We've given up the energy to an electron hole pair in the graphene layer, okay? But you can see here the total recombination rate relative to the vacuum uh, result is extreme. It can reach 10 to the 11. So that's a really extreme Purcell enhancement. But unfortunately, most of that 
goes into the formation of electron hole pairs. If we only look at the part that couples to the plasmon, then the Purcell enhancement is 10 to the 5, which is still very high. But the problem here is that most of the times that the electron goes down, it has not created a plasmon, it has created an electron hole pair. So now the challenge is to find a new material that we can build a van der Waals quantum well out of that has a dispersion, this is the dispersion in the quantum well, that does not really intersect with this region where we have a strong formation of electron hole pairs in the graphene layer. So, so that's now a material design project that we are working on. So now for the last five minutes, let me uh, switch gear and talk about uh, data-driven, uh, yeah? I guess I have the problem if you were doing the MBE system, then you have to worry about what the energies are between the Palomo and putting it in different places. That turn, didn't turn out to be very interesting to figure that out. You're, you're assuming that you cluster not coupled well, which is no good because they're all wire coupled. But what are the work functions to the Palomo MBE? If you're coupling something, Yeah. So we are not really worrying about work functions here. We are. We, yeah, I mean, we are looking at, at electrons going from, from a, one state inside the material to another state inside the material. We don't really care where the vacuum level is. We're not going out to vacuum, so I think it's okay. So uh, high throughput computation, I think, uh, in my view, this is really a new paradigm for electronic structure calculations. We're trying now to build codes that can automatically perform calculations for thousands of materials without the PhD student having to really touch the, the, the keyboard very much. Um, so it reduces the time it takes to produce results. It uh, reduces the application of efforts. And I think it also minimizes the risk for making errors, right? When you make these workflow scripts once and for all and you test them, they're good. They shouldn't, they shouldn't give, you, give you errors after that. It enhances the reproducibility of, of, of data and, and data sharing and, and uh, data quality. So um, what we've done specifically here in this project is to build this uh, C2DB, the Computational 2D Materials Database. You can find the paper, it's published, it's out there. This is an online database that you can go and search. There are around 4,000 different 2D materials and they've been characterized with respect to a large number of, of properties. The way we construct the materials is we start from some crystal structure. This could be MOS2. We know that exists. Then we take that crystal structure and we decorate the lattice with other atoms from the periodic system. Then we generate what we call hypothetical 2D materials because we don't know if these exist in reality. But we can compute whether they are stable or not. And if they are stable, we run them through this workflow where we calculate all these properties. Uh, and I think the, uh, the main um, features of this database compared to other databases is that um, consistency is very high. We're using the same code, the same settings for all calculations. It's very transparent. All the scripts that we've used to generate the data are available. You can download them. Um, it's online. You can browse it or you can download the entire database. And then we are implying at, uh, or using advanced methodology here sort of beyond DFT we're using many body perturbation theory, at least for the materials that are not too complicated. So how does this database compare to other um, databases that have been made um, starting from DFT? And some of them are here, the materials project, the A-flow, OQMD, the NOMAD repository. So I've tried to put our database up here in this diagram where um, out here we have the number of materials, and this is probably a log scale. I know that the NOMAD repository has around 50 million DFT calculations in there right now. And uh, as I said, there are only 4,000 materials in ours. So we're out here in this axis. But then we have a large an amount of different properties up here. And this is good for many things. For example, we can develop simple models and we can test established simple models. Here is an example where we look at the well-known Matoinier model for predicting um, exciton binding energies based on the excitonic mass and the dielectric constant of the material. And we plot that, the model binding energy against this full-blown quantum beta salpeter equation. And you can see that, well, there is a trend, but there are also significant deviations. And then we can go in and analyze the reason for that. We can also look at structure property relationships. This is an example where we've taken 
uh, around 1,000 of the ma magnetic materials in the database. And we can see that we can sort of correlate the size of the magnetic moment and the magnetic anisotropy in these materials with the chemical um, uh, constituent or the chemical composition of the material. And one thing that is striking here is that to have a high magnetic anisotropy that is driven by the spin-orbit coupling, it's not so much about the metal atoms, it's more about the non-metal atom here, in particular the halogens seems to correlate, may, uh, seem the, the, the halogens here, iodine, uh, bromine, chlorine, seems to correlate with having a high magnetic anisotropy, which is maybe surprising, but these are the kind of things you can do with this. Um, here are just some of the um, structures that we have in the database. Um, we have around 40 different crystal structures, and this is just sort of showing some of the band structures uh, that are in there, but not very interesting. Yeah. Okay, what about stability? So that's a main issue. When we compute these hypothetical 2D materials, are they really stable? And we've, um, so, we based on, on the calculation of the phonons to look whether the phonons have imaginary frequencies or real frequencies. We can say whether these materials are going to be dynamically stable based on the energy, the total energy of these materials relative to other competing phases of the material, the energy above the convex hull, we can say something about the thermodynamic stability. But DFT calculations are not the ground truth, and so there are errors and uh, uncertainties in there. So what we did to try to put sort of a, a threshold for these numbers was to take uh, 55 synthesized monolayers. So we looked in the literature, identified 55 different 2D materials that have been synthesized, and then we calculate, they happen to be in the database already, so then we could look at uh, their values for the thermodynamic stability and the dynamical stability and say, well, at least these materials should be stable according to our criteria. So this is what we use to set a threshold for, for these quantities here. And if we do that, we find that around 20% of the materials that we create by just sort of combinatorial lattice decoration turn out to be stable. So we have a success rate of around 20% when we create materials in this fashion here. Okay, and this is, I think, my last slide because I'm running out of time, but, but this is just to show you what we're doing now is we're screening this database uh, for many different types of properties. We have already finished uh, a study of ferromagnets, Janus structures, topological materials, uh, interesting semiconductors for photovoltaics and also piezoelectric materials. Um, and the list is longer here. And, and um, yeah, so there are many interesting things to learn when we have these databases of, of materials. And these slides were boring anyway. Um, so these are the conclusions that I think I will just flash here uh, in the interest of time. And I've already thanked my collaborators and the funding agencies, so I'll just Thank you now for the attention.